So we thank you all for sticking around. This is the last session of the day. We've got two more great days of content, but right now we've got a topic that affects a lot of us. Five years ago, if you could spell CI, you were doing pretty good. <laughs> uh, but that's become a big part of what all of us are doing. And it's just having a, a server doing your automatic builds is table stakes. But what are the best practices around that? Um, I always like to hear from companies that are doing good things around that, so I'm very excited for this panel. So this is going to be led by Sean Langton, and take it away. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to echo the, uh, the thanks for everybody. Yeah, sure. Let's get it going. <clears throat> the happy hour is working. <laughs> um, yeah, and thank you guys for uh, you know, coming in here with, to finish your beers and finish your day with us. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got... Uh, three great, great guests with us here today who are going to be doing most of the talking. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves quickly. Peter, do you want to start? All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Actually, happy hour and CI is a very good combination because <laughs> oftentimes when you work on CI, you really want a beer. So my name is Peter. Uh, I work on PSPDF Kit. I'm the founder. We are in Dropbox and IBM and Flavius Lufthansa, like an SDK that shows PDF on all platforms, not just iOS, but we come from the iOS world and it's still our most important market. Um, and yeah, we see it's very important for us, like every, every pull request runs all the platforms automated and we are happy partner of Mac Stadium. Great. Hey everyone, my name is Daniel Hagen. I'm the director of IT for Aspire Media. Um, we are known as the world's largest Mac publisher of video games. So many of you probably have played a few of ours, hopefully. Actually, a applause, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, yeah, anything from Civilization to Call of Duty to Sims, we've, we've played around with a lot of the good games. So. Um, <clears throat> My background comes from web, web development, so CI, CD to me is a lot of automated pipelines, automated testing, automated uh, unit tests, that sort of thing. Um, so bringing that into a thick client uh, world has been an interesting endeavor, and working with development teams that come from probably a little bit stuck in the 1980s um, has been a, an ende endeavor of its own. So. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to bring that about and, and make things happen a lot faster and a lot quicker. Thank you, Daniel. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Debayan, and I lead the mobile tools team at Pandora slash SiriusXM now. So for those of you who don't know, SiriusXM recently acquired Pandora, which makes us the largest music streaming company in the U.S., so we have over 100 million monthly active users. You can imagine the scale at which we have to run our things. And um, I was actually the first mobile tools engineer, the first DevOps engineer at Pandora. So I can say that we have come a very long way and it's been a great arduous journey, not only like building out the CI infrastructure, but just changing the culture and kind of bringing in a DevOps mindset that allows us to scale. So I think that has been like a very challenging journey and you know very enriching journey as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to just give a few words about what continuous integration is. I think probably everybody in this room came because they already know, but spend two seconds on it. Um, also, I'm Sean Langton. I work at Mac Stadium. I lead our sales and marketing teams and spend a lot of time thinking about how to make sure that everybody knows what's out there, how to use it, so that we can help. Um, continuous integration is basically part of the DevOps workflow. It really focuses in on the build and test portions. The idea is that you're going to run a build every time you merge code with a pull request. You're going to test every time you build. It helps you catch errors faster and brings a faster time to value by shifting things left so you catch them sooner. Um, of course, <clears throat> again, as I'm sure you all know, when you do this for the Apple ecosystem, you have to do all your builds and a lot of your tests using Xcode. Xcode only runs on Mac OS. Mac OS only runs on genuine Apple hardware. 
which means you have to find some way to get it and deploy it at scale. Um, once you have it deployed, you have to automate it, and a lot of the tricks that DevOps teams use for every other platform will not work for macOS. So that's why we have a packed house at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And um, <clears throat> you know, Mac Stadium helps. In case you're not familiar, we have data centers around the world. We have about 20,000 Macs deployed in our data centers, and we're buying them pretty much as fast as we can. We have Mac Minis, Mac Pros. We have iMac Pros deployed. And we work with all of the different virtualization technologies, whether it's VMware, Anka, or Orca, which we are just announcing this week. If you'd like to learn more about how to use Kubernetes to orchestrate Mac VMs, come talk to us at our booth uh, anytime throughout the week. But I won't get into that now. You know, we're also, of course, very excited about rack-mounted Mac Pros and what the future may hold for that. Um, the fall ends on December 20th, in case anybody hadn't checked their calendar. So we'll see when that actually ships. So that's enough about um, context. I want to spend the rest of the time here talking with these guys about some of their experiences on these topics. So we'll get started. Um, you know, you've heard a bit about who they are and what the companies are, but I think it makes a lot of sense to start by understanding what are the endpoints that these guys are targeting, how are their teams structured, and what are their end users expecting to find in an app. Um, so take it away. Sure. So I probably represent uh, the smaller company side here. We have like to other giants in the room. Um, for us, the important part is it needs to be very cost effective, it needs to be simple to administer, and of course it should be fast and good. So we, obviously we need Mac hardware to run our Mac tests, and we also like want, want to use Mac hardware to like build Mac software. Um, we started using Jenkins very early on, so I think we're like eight years in or seven years in. Um, Everybody hates it, but it, <laughs> it, it gets the job done. Um, we're now having a project to migrate to BuildKite because we slowly see that Jenkins doesn't really scale well. When you update the plugin, all the jobs need to stop, and then Jenkins needs to restart, and then you have to hope that it boots up again because if the plugin update failed, then you'll just get an error and you have to like manually undo it, and it's very, very messy. But there's a lot of those problems you can live with, so I think it's a decent choice if you look at the options out there. Uh, for us, it now makes sense to like move to a little bit of a better, um, also more expensive system. So uh, setup-wise, we we started with iOS. So um, very early on, we we wanted to like have hosted Max. We are a remote company, so there is no real office, meaning there's also no real data center. Uh, like for a while, I had like Mac, Mac Minis at my home, and then the cleaning lady unplugged them. <laughs> which is like, you know, it's like not really professional. It's like so uh, kind of annoying. So uh, having those things in an actual data center is nice. Uh, there's not that many companies out there where you can actually do that. So you can do your own research. I did, and uh, that's why I chose Mac Stadium. So this is maybe be a marketing ploy, but I don't get any affiliation. <laughs> uh, they are very good to work with. We, we looked at the different products. I mean, they have like Mac Pros and uh, still Xserves as well, if they still exist. They still exist. Not many people <laughs> use them anymore. So, but, but we chose the simplest setup possible, again, because our setup needs to be cost effective. It was just Mac Minis. One Mac Mini for one user uh, doing one test at a time, or sometimes two. And in the very early days, we set them up manually. You just VNC in, and like you have somebody doing a lot of clicking. That gets annoying very quickly, so don't do that. We then invested a lot of time in Ansible and automating everything. Once we like, were like at 95% done, we found out that Microsoft uh, maintains a really, really good chef repository with like a, a cookbook. With some, so you can basically pick what you want from like installing Xcode to a lot more esoteric things. We use uh, Mac Minis to not only test iOS, but also test macOS, uh, and also do Android testing. So for Android, we also use Jenny Motion because the Android simulator, I don't know if, we, if the code of conduct allows swear words, but sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we try also to like keep our setup as simple as possible. There is like 
Macs, and then we have obviously Windows for the Windows tests. Um, but we didn't want to have like yet another Linux system for Android. We just reuse macOS to like keep keep the variables small. Um, the main challenges is actually not finding a partner. I mean, these guys are really easy to work with. The main challenge is to make sure the tests are stable. Make sure that macOS works, that your automated tests work. So a lot of the, the trouble is actually making sure you're ready for the new Xcode release, you're ready, new, ready for the new macOS release. Apple usually gives you half a year time to update macOS before they release an Xcode version that doesn't run on the previous macOS version anymore. So you really have to be fast. Now this year is even more interesting because, for example, we're going to release PDF Viewer for the Mac in fall. Is that recorded? <laughs> 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 I don't know. This is just my wish. But eventually, you said fall is until December 20th. So yeah, you got plenty uh, of time. <laughs> um, but this actually forces us to be even faster. We need to like have a version running with with macOS 10.15 on on CI. So for us, running them bare metal, like just having the Mac Mini and just having that on, reduces a lot of variables. Like there's a lot of benefits in Orca and all those more fancy orchestrations, but it also is sometimes a little bit more trouble. It sometimes takes a little bit longer for it to work. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we chose to keep it simple. Also, like we are at a scale where this still works. If you have, I don't know, thousands of devices, uh, then it might get a little more annoying to do that. But we currently have, I don't know, 20, 30. So this is still a number that's very fine. And sometimes if a Mac makes trouble or it's weird, you just, we just reset it and like let Chef run. That takes around half a day to like install macOS, install Xcode, install the Android Studio, like all the things we need. And then it's basically exactly at the level that we expect it to be. And then we can just add it to our Jenkins farm again. Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so it, it's interesting hearing some of that and some of the similarities in our environments. Um, Aspire started going through a transition about a year, year and a half ago to move a lot of our data center services off-site. Um, we were running a full build farm internally. Um, actually, I say internally, similar to your story. It lived in a developer's office. And uh, more than once, the power turned off and it shut down the build farm. So uh, that, that was changed. All the, the endpoints that did the builds were moved into our little server closet. And that gave us a little bit more stability. But as we continue to grow and our project count goes up, um, there's no way I can continue to grow our build node count internally. Uh, effectively, and that's where I stumbled across Mac Stadium. Um, again, no affiliation here, uh, <laughs> bonus points here, but they are uh, excellent hosts for us. They they have provided us a way to expand out when we kind of hit our maximum. Um, our endpoints, for the most part, have been Mac and iOS, although we do also build for PC and Linux and uh, PlayStation and Xbox and you name it, we've got it. Um, so for us, Jenkins has been, been our, our back end for that. Uh, just firing off build scripts that the developers go, hey, it worked on my system. I commit it to, our, it, we run on a Perforce server for source control and that stores it there. Uh, Jenkins pulls that script out and, and kicks it off. Um, the struggle we've had lately is kind of to your point about the, uh, the build image. Every version of OS X needs to have a certain version of Xcode and all the uh, affiliate libraries in order to compile these build artifacts. And uh, traditionally, yes, it's the go through click, click, click through a remote desktop session just to set it all up. We did get to a point where we kind of found what I call our golden image. We, we find what we want it to be for that version of Xcode and, and OS X, and we, we archive that off and keep it around just in case we have to build ancient versions of builds, which we do. Um, and then 
Uh, actually, thanks to a tip from Mac Stadium, we started playing around with a Jenkins plugin called Instant Clone, or VM Fork, however you may refer to that, um, where we're able to then just spin off ephem ephemeral images of our uh, golden image and run our build in that, sync up our code repository, compile, and go. A big point of that was getting our CI builds going. Um, developers, uh, it, it's been interesting. Our developers come from a background where you only commit when you have something to commit. And we're changing that culture to a commit and commit often, so you find out what you're breaking as you break it. Um, and, and that's what this pipeline has given us the ability to do. They commit in, it kicks off a quick CI build, um, finds out what they just broke, they get an email back, and they're able to quickly iterate off of that instead of waiting for a full feature to be complete, committed in, send it off to build, and then find out. Just kidding, you've got to rebuild a lot of that feature. So that's been helpful for us. Um, the other part about our, our business that makes us a little bit unique is uh, video games are such a manual testing heavy project. You can't do automated builds on a majority of our projects. You might be able to do some unit tests around uh, the UI and, and whether it even loads. That was one of our first unit tests. Does the game load? Does it crash? Um, from there, it goes into manual testing, and the more we can catch these simple errors before it even gets put in the pipeline for QA, just saves us time and, and effort. So for, for me, it was just a, a process of implement small changes as you go. It's actually kind of a CI CD of a CI CD. Find out what works, deploy new changes, and, and keep it going. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting stories. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, so we use Jenkins as our primary CI tool, uh, which I'm sure Peter vehemently disagrees. <laughs> but um, from my experience, and I think many others will share, when you're at a scale as big as uh, Pandora or you know, Aspire or any other company, that has that scale, Jenkins is just the most scalable solution at that point. Uh, if you're not at that stage, there are various other tools like, you know, like Build Kite, Circle CI. Uh, you have abundant budget, and you know, those tools are very efficient to get out of the box. But what Jenkins prov provides you is the flexibility and the scalability, which too for us works great and does for many other companies as well. Um, how many of you here have uh, used Mac Minis on your desktop to run your CI? Raise your hands. That's it, that's like 70% of the room. <laughs> so that's pretty much been the experience like everywhere I've been. And uh, most of the times so I come from a DevOps background that's mostly working on cloud, AWS, GCP, Azure. And uh, everywhere in every company that I've worked in, for the mobile part of it is the most neglected, right? It's almost like they're third class citizens. I don't know why, right? So I see these developers have their Mac minis on their desk, they're developing their apps and you know, kind of like, oh, here, here's my APK, here's my IPA, go and test it, you know, that kind of model. And when I joined Pandora, it was very unique because uh, we didn't have a mobile tools team, we didn't have mobile DevOps or anything like that. Uh, so the entire Pandora ap application, like all the client teams, were sharing just six VM instances. So they were building, they were testing, they were doing everything on these six instances, and that's it. So what does that mean? That means that we have four and a half month release cycles, <laughs> right? And uh, we're like, okay, this is definitely not scalable, this is not gonna work. So I was like, okay, we have to change this, right? And the first thing that we needed was more hardware to run. Now, since I was the only one, and I didn't want to overburden myself by going with Linux and you know, Mac OS, I decided to share Mac OS with iOS and Android, and of course, automation as well. So the first thing was to build a CI pipeline, which was great. 
CI pipeline works, but now all the jobs are in queue because there are now no longer any more executors to run the builds. So, okay, so how do we solve that? So the other challenge was, where do we put these Mac minis and how do we provision them? So I asked, hey, how do you guys provision your Mac minis? And they're like, oh, it's easy. We take a disk, put it in, copy an image, and then go to each Mac mini and provision them independently. I'm like, wow, that's definitely not scalable. <laughs> so, very, very 90s way to do it. So I asked them, like, hey, do we have a data center where we can put these Mac minis? And they were like, yeah, we have a data center, but it runs Linux servers. We have no idea how to rack Mac minis. So it's like, OK. Uh, that became a challenge. So slowly we started like, you know, I started talking to our you know, data center team, the site ops team, and we finally got a bunch of Mac minis racked up. So from you know, like six VMs, we went up to like 75, right? <laughs> so once we have these 75 VMs, I was like, okay, now how are we gonna provision this? Of course, the answer is use a provisioning tool. Which one's free? Oh, Ansible's free. It's great. <laughs> it's written in Python. I don't know how many of you have used Ansible here, but it's a very, very, very powerful tool. Um, you know, the other alternatives are Chef and Puppet. Uh, you can also use Salt. But uh, Ansible, you know, was great. So I wrote a bunch of Ansible scripts, automated everything for iOS provisioning, Android, uh, for all of our automation suite. And guess what? I ran the script. And it took down our corporate network because it tried to download Xcode at the same time. So I got pinged by the NetOps director, and he's like, hey, what the hell are you doing? You just took down the entire corpnet. And I'm like, oh, OK. So then I got called into a meeting and said, hey, you have to come up with a new solution because this is not going to work for us. I'm like, oh, OK. So then I started looking around, and I came across this uh, tool called Anka. So Anka is basically the Docker for Mac. So they provide like Mac OS virtualization. And then I was like, OK, so this is one part of my solution. The other part is to get hardware that scales, because it takes us months to you know, create a, re a requirement for Mac minis or whatever, like Mac Pros, and then actually rack them up in the data center and you know, make it actually functional. So then I came across Mac Stadium, and I can tell you that both of these, uh, you know, these, uh, these companies are great to work with. They're super easy to work with, great support team. And uh, we have been using them for like over two years now, both of them. And it just scales so well. So with Anka, what you have to do is essentially you create one instance. And each instance is tagged. So think of it like Git. So you run your Ansible on one image. Uh, you make the changes and you commit it to a centralized repository. Then you have an orchestrator. The orchestrator, what it does is it looks at the repository, it knows all the images that you have, and it caches every image on your nodes, which are our Mac Stadium nodes, right? And then you integrate it with Jenkins in a way that is completely ephemeral, which means that you now have, you can now forget about the concept of slaves and Jenkins, right? So what you're doing is essentially triggering a job. The job talks to an Anka plugin and says, hey, I want to build myself. Where can I build myself? That, the Jenkins plugin now goes and talks to the orchestrator and says, hey, I need an image for so-and-so version provisioned to me. That now goes and checks the hardware pool that's available spins up an image in seconds, runs your job, runs your tests, runs your builds, and destroys it. That's it. So the same hardware can be shared across any different configuration, any testing, Android builds, iOS, web clients, whatever you need. You can just build it. So that, I think, was the biggest thing that, uh, you know, the biggest CI achievement that we made at Pandora, which actually allowed us to release um, Siri shortcuts for iOS 12 launch on day one, beating Apple Music and Spotify. Hey. <laughs> and the reason was because we could spin up images with customized Xcode versions. So each branch was building up different Xcode versions, different OS beta versions. And we were able to get that continuous feedback from our manual testers, from our automation testers, and of course, from the developers as well. 
So I think that was like the pinnacle of our CI, Mac OS CI uh, system. That's great. Yeah. Um, a lot in all of those. I wanted to just unpack some of the, the themes that came up. So <clears throat> you guys had talked about, um, you know, Peter, you've used, you were using Ansible, you moved to Chef. Uh, Debian kind of went with Ansible and stuck with it. I think, Dan, you had, you sort of found your, your golden images through a bit of trial and error. Um, I wanted to just kind of stick on that topic a little bit because that whole defining your infrastructure as code is, a, is an important piece. Um, you know, maybe just spend a moment kind of comparing and contrasting, you know, start with you, Peter, your experiences with the two of them and, and how, you know, what advice you would give to the room on how to think about which is the right tool and where to get resources for it. So we, I mean, the code, like having infrastructure as code was very important for us. That's why Ansible or Chef, like anything that scripts and can recreate an environment from scratch was like so attractive for us compared to images. We, we played with images, we did the whole hypervisor thing, but ultimately both cost and complexity were like higher for us, like with the, we're not in the four digits on machine, so I think like our solution works really well for our scale. Um, the main reason why we moved to Chef was because we found that Microsoft has such a great selection of Mac specific cookbooks that it was just such a huge time saver for us. Uh, all the things that we had to write ourselves and community is really important. So if you have a very strong player who provides a lot of things and we contribute to that repository now as well, uh, again, a huge time saver, ultimately a cost saver. We're bootstrapped, so I need to actually look at every dollar or euro, in my case, that we spend. So like the priority is a little bit different. Um, so that's also like why we choose Mac Minis and like for a long time we we used the 2012 uh, four-core Mac Minis because they were like pretty cheap and like okay on performance. Obviously, like a Mac Pro would be faster, but again, the cost for its performance was not beneficial for us. So then, when the 2018 Mac Minis came, this was actually huge for us because it it basically made a full build from four hours down to two. Now, like with some other improvements, we are I think at 30 minutes. So uh, that's for releasing. So testing is actually faster because it doesn't need to build all the architectures and we can like streamline a lot of that and like distribute tests to multiple machines. Um, we, have, we have like model tests, UI tests, and like we just use multiple machines to distribute that for us using more expensive machines that are a little bit faster. For our workload, that helps a little more. I think I'm talking really too much. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Daniel, what was, you know, if, I don't know if you looked into it and found that it wouldn't work for some reason or if you've kind of, you know, got um, any plans to approach defining those images more clearly, if you could talk about that. Yeah, so um, this is a process that we're actively going through right now. Um, I come from a background, I've handled all our, our web infrastructure, and for that I've used, used Chef, mm -hmm. and so that's our go-to. Um, most of that came about because it's written in Ruby, and our web services are written in Ruby. So that just made a lot of sense, and, and to Peter's point, it's such a well-covered community. It re reduced our individual contribution effort uh, drastically to be able to use that. Um, the struggle that we are hitting with, uh, with these build image configuration scripts is uh, really wrapped around our SDKs. Like the open ones are easy. Android SDK, even Xcode, you can kind of easily grab those images off the internet, um, provided you have an account. Um, some of the ones that were a little limited in our access on, such as PlayStation and Xbox, we have to very tightly control those, so we can't just, you know, wget a, a SDK image off the internet. You have to have it on your local network, you have to secure it, and, and actually, on some of them, audit every transfer of them. Um, so for those, we're looking into building our own cookbooks. Um, the struggle there has been that uh, the cookbooks generally get designed by the people who are familiar with the SDK, and our people familiar with SDK are, are 
game developers who mostly do Objective C and uh, C++. So they're not really game for writing Ruby cookbooks. So that it, it's creating a, a clash of the worlds where they're having to lean on my infrastructure team to, to build these cookbooks out uh, while we partner with them to uh, stabilize golden images so developers aren't clicking through to, to build every image. Thanks. Um, you know, so kind of this is getting into the idea of tips and tricks and secrets and hacks. Um, what are some of the things, Debian, that you've found that are you know, you know, maybe in Xcode configurations or yeah. little nits that you wouldn't find unless you had already kind of walked the path for a yeah, couple of years? Yeah, so, so some of the biggest optimizations, uh, so here's a tip that will definitely speed up your bills, and that is to disable Spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Spotlight indexing. So There's a chef script for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, a Ansible script. But uh, yeah, as soon as you disable Spotlight, uh, but you have to make sure that you're not using XC version to switch between Xcode versions. So that became a challenge for us because we had multiple Xcode versions on the same image, and we would run the script that would select the Xcode version using XC version switch. And then uh, the problem was that the spotlight indexing is required for running XC versions. So then we had to like kind of make the images isolated so we didn't have to switch within the image, and we would have like separate images for each Xcode versions. That allowed us to disable Spotlight, and that immediately increased our build time by almost 15%, which is like great. So the other, uh, you want to say something? Uh, or? Go for it. No, <laughs> no, no. I actually have a, I have a tip. Yeah. Yeah, neither uh, of you say so anything. The, the spotlight thing you can also solve by like selectively disabling some folders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we disable like the, everything where code lives and derive data, um, which almost gives you the same percentage, but you can still do most of the things because some part of macOS just really gets weird if spotlight's disabled. Apple is only testing the golden pass and not thinking about those things. Yeah. Especially if you're used to command space bar to type in an app name and launch it, killing spotlight kills that. Um, for me, uh, our biggest, uh, the biggest tip I, I can think of is actually on our artifact delivery. Once we've compiled the builds, keep in mind, if anyone here has played Borderlands, I'm so sorry, but it's a 20 gigabyte build. That is not something you just transfer over the network whenever you want to. Or if you do, you get that network admin, which is me. Um, <laughs> uh, very unhappy. So uh, actually, what we ended up doing is adding, th this is going to sound a little no-duh, but putting Dropbox on our build nodes and copying the build artifact into there. And then it will seed out to all of our QA machines that are on the same uh, Dropbox share and they can selectively uh, pick which project folder they want to be syncing. And so part of the benefit on a CIC pipeline, it doesn't have to just be built when someone commits code. It can be a nightly build, a noon build, a, a, you know, first thing in the morning build. Those builds go off. Everything gets synced into the folder. Those computers are up all the time. Um, so they download them as they're able. They client across from each other. Uh, on the local network instead of through every switch node. And, uh, and that has saved us a ton of bandwidth and gotten our QA department builds when they need it, r right when the build's out there. So that, that's probably my biggest tip. That's awesome. What else you guys got? Just yeah, sorry. I'm watching people take notes in the audience, so I think we're on to something. So, so one more. Uh, uh, important benefit that we got out of using Anka was that we were able to actually cache everything inside the image, which meant that we could produce images that cached our entire source code. It also could cache our build artifacts, dependencies, everything within the image itself, which also saved an incredible amount of time. So, sorry, I'll, I'll just chime in on that. That's another thing we're doing on these golden images is I consider them golden as in they're stabilized in all the tool set, but we are also what I call rehydrating them. We bring them back online, sync them up to the latest code every week, and then shut them back down and clone off of that. 
That way, every time you create that ephemeral build and it has to sync up to the latest, it's only a few days behind. I have a few more tips um, to how, you, how you can like reduce the number of machines you need. I'm actually curious, is anybody using monorepos for your setup? Do we have? Oh yeah, maybe 10%, 8%. So, so we, we switched to one giant monorepo for all our platforms, which then means every time somebody did a pull request, uh, I think 50 drops spinned up, like iOS, Android, web, Windows, macOS. On iOS, you needed 32-bit and 64-bit. Now we can drop the 32-bit, finally. Uh, on Android, different versions, iPad, iPhone, um, iOS 11, 12, 13 now. So, so like a lot of combinations. So there was like a lot of machines. And uh, I mean, we like Mac Stadium. We also like not paying too much. <laughs> Reasonable. So, so one of the things we did is we, we wrote something on Jenkins, and I fully agree Jenkins is the most uh, flexible system. So we made sure when we, we saw a move to build kite, we can do this there as well. We use something that we call selective pull request testing. You can actually Google selective pull request testing PSPDF kit, and you find a blog post about just that, where we basically, uh, a script looks at what files changed and then analyzes what platform it will impact. So for example, if I change something, blah, blah, view controller, in the iOS subdirectory, um, Jenkins knows through the script that it only needs to run the iOS tests, not core, not Android, not everything else, which saves a huge number of machines. Now, if somebody else from the core team, and it's like, if that's our sh shared C++ layer, changes something, that means everything has to be tested. So what our core team then does is for many of the PRs is because they also like commit early, commit often, but they don't like commit so often that CI is clogged for hours. We, we use like a tag on GitHub and then a Jenkins script, again, I think that's actually available. You don't have to write this yourself. Looks for skip CI for the tag and then just doesn't run CI until I remove the skip CI tag. And so if you like are a little bit careful when you open a pull request early, you can save a ton of load on CI. And then once your pull request gets towards completion, you can still get those feedback, especially in the, if you do like a larger refactor, you don't need all that feedback in, in, the, in the early times. And again, it's just like saves cost, time, ultimately machines, right? Um, yeah, so we use a bunch of tricks to reduce our load. Or like, um, we have something where we start with one test, and only if that succeeds, we spin off others. So you can, you can get very creative depending on how, how important time for us costs is. Uh, depending on your organization and like how much you want to spend, there is a lot of place to optimize in the direction. You talked about reducing the build time from one hour down to 30, you know, yeah. four hours down to two hours, I think you said, and then uh, just by changing hardware, which is a great way to speed things up. Yeah. But then from two hours down to 30 minutes, uh, you know, I don't know how much of that is some of the selective pull requests that you're talking about, or if you have some other tricks on uh, uh, you know, achieving a 4x. So we also yeah. use something called Ccache and distcc. So we actually distribute some of the compile artifacts across build servers, which uh, is much faster than compiling everything directly. And uh, this uh, CC cache is built in a way that it really, it, it's kind of like an intermediary layer between the compiler and, and the output, so it's just like called before, and if it if the the thing that that you, it's called is the same and all the files are the same, then it will just like use a cached result and not even call the compiler. So like if you use that, then you get it right, and you can like often, especially if you switch branches, get a, a huge speed up. And another one is that we dropped iOS 10, which dropped 32 bit, which was really nice and just <laughs> half the architectures we needed. Just like Intel 368 uh, and 86 and ARM 47 was gone, which basically is like also the other half of the time that we could reduce. Yeah. Um, any other tips from, I mean, I know that uh, speeding up build times is always uh, a hot topic. Any ideas on that? Uh, so one thing I'll see is that uh, we recently did like an extensive uh, amount of benchmarking between Linux servers and Mac, uh, you know, Mac hardwares uh, from Mac Stadium for running our Android builds. So like I told you the story, so I was the only person on the team, which is why I went with, you know, uh, all Mac solution. But now that my team's much bigger, it's like, oh, why not give it a shot, right? 
And uh, what we found out was that, so we ran tests across a bunch of AMD Epic servers, which we have in-house in our data center. And we also used uh, GCP to do the benchmarking. And what we found out was shockingly was that the 2018 six core minis are actually almost two to three times faster, Ooh. even for Android. We hear that a lot. And a part of it, I think, has to do with the fact that the, um, the builds do better when they're on sort of a real computer where the memory and the hard drive and the processor are all physically close to each other versus a scaled out sort of data center architecture. It also depends on the process's speed. See so if you have like long, run, like long running tasks which depend on a single processor, then the six core minis are definitely way more scalable. If you are more multi-threaded, then maybe, you know. Yeah. But yeah. You go first. Um, Pick a mic, any mic. It's good thing um, they only gave him one mic. I know. <laughs> I feel like the MC here. Um, you take it because I have to remember. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, one more tip, and it goes towards build stability because you all want green tests, and like hopefully they should be green without retrying five times. So we experimented a lot again because we want to save costs and like be as efficient as possible, but. One machine should do one thing at a time. Don't try to be clever. Don't like try to do Android tests and iOS tests on the same machine, or or play with this. Oh, there's this checkbox for um, parallel testing in Xcode. This is nice. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, especially for model tests, it probably matters less because they are just much more predictable. But if you do iOS, you probably do XCUI tests, and this is just like really fragile. Like, ideally, the machine shouldn't do anything else, because a lot of it is timing dependent, and you just want to minimize all those, uh, all, everything that could like cause a huge spike in CPU, and then suddenly something that usually takes one second takes 10 seconds, but X could only wait five seconds, and then it aborts, and then you have to retry, and then ultimately everything takes longer. So don't try to become too clever. One machine, one account, one test at a time. Uh, ultimately, that will be much more reliable. Um, please prove me wrong, because I would love to like optimize it more. But we tried a lot on those in that area, and everything ultimately cost more time. Because if you fail, then like it blocks the pull request. Like you have to wait long. Everybody gets annoyed. <laughs> Just and VMs are definitely a good way to solve that. If you, while keeping. Yeah. So Keeping things super clean, but you still have multiple tests or multiple builds running on the same machine. So, so not to geek out on that too much, but the difference between kernel time management versus a hypervisor time slicing is where that benefit comes in. Uh, kernel management will do its best to share out CPU uh, uh, clock cycle, but uh, VM hypervisor time, uh, time slicing is the best way that I know of uh, by, by data reports that you can get the most bang for your buck on the hardware. Um, I, I remembered what I was going to say kind of to the build time and, and what hardware does. So for anyone who's a fan of Civilization VI, um, we currently build the desktop version of that on uh, our developers have like MacBook Pros, uh, 2017 edition or um, some of the, not the latest iMac Pro, but the previous. Um, we were doing about a two and a half hour to, to three hour build for that locally. Um, we got the newest Mac minis and that dropped to about 40 minutes. So that, that tells you a little bit on the performance spec there. We got the new iMac Pro, 10 minutes flat. <coughs> that, that thing's a beast. Yeah. Um, the, the other th uh, thing I wanted to mention with that, though, is one of the things we looked into, I don't know how many of you have messed around in Xcode and seen the, uh, the cloud build or, or, or remote build option in Xcode. It's basically a way for you to connect your local, built, your local IDE environment to another, um, another Mac to have it compile over there. Um, we looked at that as an option to do uh, builds that don't block the developer and let them keep going. Um, it is very inefficient. It seems to be very immature. Um, 
And, and the big thing that I took away from it, and, and another thing that I would say is the benefit from building out a CI CD pipeline. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of, but it works on my machine. <laughs> Anytime that a developer commits their code, it goes off to another machine that was configured by someone else, it compiles it, it tests it, it hands it off to QA. That means that they can't just compile it locally, get it going great, and hand it off to QA, and suddenly it doesn't work for QA. They get stopped at the CI CD pipeline going, well, it may work just fine on your system, but you had a library that you didn't commit in. Fix it. Yep, that, and that gets to the culture change point, which I think all three of you guys mentioned uh, right as you were starting off. So I think that we're almost at time here. Um, there's a whole bunch of folks, and I'm sure you all brought questions that are you know, interesting and specific to you. Um, some of them are probably about some of these new features that we heard about yesterday. So I'd like to open it up for questions. I know that uh, because this is the last session, uh, they said we could go a little late. So we'll go until we run out of questions or run out of people. So the questions we have down to one microphone, use your outdoor voice. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. West, what was the question? Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, do we use TestFlight internally to distribute builds to our testing groups? And the answer for all three of us is yes. <laughs> how does that fit into your CI pipeline? So how does I'll, that fit into I'll take the that CI one first. Um, so we have not automated it yet. That's my short answer. <laughs> you want, you want? Yeah, so we have a complete CI CD solution, which means that we do automatically upload it to TestFlight and Hockey App, which is our two primary distribution channels. Uh, we use Fastlane. If any of you, how many of you are familiar with Fastlane here? Great, most of you are. So of course, so yeah. So we use Fastlane Pilot. It's built into our CI pro CD process. So it runs through a bunch of automated tests. Once the, all the gates pass then we automatically deploy it uh, to test flight and hockey app. A li li little, little final story. Fasten was actually created because I, I, I dragged uh, Felix Krause to our cockroach in Austria, in Vienna. <laughs> and there he met Order, and then they talked, and that ultimately led to Fastlane. So we also use Fastlane. Congratulations. To <laughs> we have Peter to thank for Fastlane. <laughs> maybe, maybe it would have also been without me. I don't know. I don't want to take credit. Um, <laughs> we, we basically do the same. So um, not every like it's not every nightly that doesn't make sense for us. But like I think every few days when it makes sense, we like we have a little bot in Slack that says um, release bot test flight this branch, and then that spins up Jenkins. It runs all the tests, and when they're all good, then it uh, uses Fastlane to upload that to to test flight, and then when it's done, then it calls back to Slack and says, yeah, your build is there, and then everybody, everybody can like, uh, test it. So the question was around how do you orchestrate key management with Anka? That's a great question. So we use Vault for a key management system. So that's kind of baked into our process. The question was Xcode settings for build with build for testing, uh, et cetera, that, um, and test without building to see how that affects build times. Uh, the build for testing, I'm actually not sure what it does. So we we basically script everything using a little bit of Fastlane and mostly our own script. So it's just like build, and then we just manually call test, and then we use something that's called trainer which then translates the Xcode test plist things into a JUnit test so Jenkins can actually parse it and show it. Uh, that's a small Ruby thing that I wrote with Felix. 
I guess that's mostly a no then. Yeah, mostly no, but I'm going to go Google it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're in the middle of moving our pipeline from Service CI to Jenkins, so this is super helpful. Um, we have a lot of UI tests, uh, and I'm trying to parallelize them across a bunch of different machines. But like one thing we found is kind of a limited fact is we wait for the simulator to spin up for ages. So I'm doing like one UI, parallelizing them all the way, it makes no sense. We're trying to find a sweet spot. Are there any like tips or tricks to like yeah. get the simulator to spin up? So tri yeah. tips and tricks to get the simulator to spin up more quickly for testing parallelization. parallelization. Yeah, so I'll take that question. So um, like I said, with Anka, you can cache the image. So you can actually have running simulators in it already. So if you want a uh, simulator for you know, Xcode 10, uh, sorry, iPhone 10 running iOS 12, uh, you can have that already in your image. So you, as soon as Jenkins fires a test, it's just going to spin up the image with the simulator already running, so you can just start executing your test. And you can do and that with every hypervisor exactly. technology. Yeah, yeah, essentially. <clears throat> yeah, we do, some, sorry, we do something similar. Like, especially the simulator sometimes needs to be spun up before because otherwise it do, does weird things. So spinning it up manually before you even build is a very good idea, also for increasing reliability. Otherwise, you sometimes get error 65, if, 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 if that <laughs> rings a bell. So. so just one more thing that I want to add is I don't know how familiar you guys are with uh, Blue Pill, but has anyone used Blue Pill here? So one of the challenges with using like third party tools to do these kind of things like parallel testing is that as every time when Apple releases something, everyone else has to play catch up, which means at that point, if your CI system heavily depends on the tool, you'll be completely biting the dust at that point because you don't know what to do. That's why we moved away from Blue Pill and have this kind of customized solution so we know that whatever you know Apple throws a surprise, a spins a surprise on us, we'll be ready to tackle it. Your, your so. destiny is at least in your own hands. It's in my point. hands, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Just so long as you accept oh. the new terms of use and download it real <laughs> fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. You had a question over here? Uh, do you guys test on real devices in CI? The question was around testing on real devices as part of CI. So um, that's something we, we tried. We did not find a solution yet. First of all, devices are not made for like 24-hour testing. If you do that, eventually the battery will explode. Um, and they regularly do if, if you, for the few services that yeah. offer that, and you talk to people that know things a little bit better. So caveat number one. Caveat number two, ideally you should completely restore the device. That's very hard to automate. I think the few companies who do, they write custom drivers and like, really do edgy stuff to like get some of that automated. Uh, so quick answer, we want to, but we haven't figured it out. Yes, yeah, so we are doing real device testing. <laughs> kind of doing everything, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, again, like to Peter's point, that is definitely not, should not be our first choice of the testing pyramid. So if you look at the testing pyramid, the majority of it should be unit tests. There's also now the testing trophy. <laughs> so that one has more integrated tests. But either way, majority of our UI tests are run on simulators and emulators. But only the tests which cannot be run on simulators and emulators, we run it on real devices. So the real devices right now we are running in-house. But right now, what we are doing is we are evaluating cloud solutions. So there are plenty of cloud providers like Sauce Labs, uh, Browser Stack, uh, Perfecto. So you can look at those as AWS Device Farm as well. But actually, what we have been building right now is an in-house solution using Anka and Mac Stadium. And it actually is working really well. So, so that we expect <laughs> to see that on Medium sometimes. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. You'll probably see an article from me about that once we're able to completely scale it. Let's do one more question. He's ready. Can I? Yeah. Uh, how do you then uh, test or automate testing of services like push notifications which are not available on some of So the question was for how do you automate 
tests that would involve things like push notifications, which are difficult in a simulated environment? Yeah, that's, that's what we are using to test on real devices. So those are the scenarios. A lot of it is also like, so for with Android, like a lot of statistics like performance, uh, memory, CPU is readily available, but it's not available on iOS or on iPhones. So, you know, it's kind of challenging. Uh, but definitely like test cases like uh, push notifications, backgrounded app, you know, like third party app integrations, those things are all we are running on uh, real devices, deep links. So I'll, I'll kind of tap on to the last question along with this one. Um, obviously video games, different, different uh, whole game there. Um, so we have a full test department. Um, it is not the dream job that every teenager thinks it is. <laughs> if, if you have a teenager who thinks that, send them to me. I will crush that dream. <laughs> um, for uh, f f I, one quick story that it made me think of with the device is always on. We, before we moved to Mac Stadium and AWS, we had a co-location in Austin, and I remember going down the aisle of racks and noticed smoke coming from one of the racks, and it was from, it wasn't an iPhone, it was an Android device, but it was a device that was left on 24-7. So to back up Peter's story, don't do that. Um, for, for things like push notifications and that sort of thing, I, I, I think I can't do anything but emphasize the, the point of automate what makes sense and, and limit what you can to the physical environments, to the physical devices. If it is something like push notifications, limit the number of iterations you have to go through on that, see how many things you can check off through a simulator, and leave that behind for something else. Uh, if it's performance specs, which is a lot of what we do, you know, how does it run on the device? What is the CPU taxed at and uh, memory use and that sort of thing? We have to do that from a, a mobile device profiling through uh, a desktop client. So we limit those as much as we can. So it really takes a, takes a build engineer. And that, that was actually going to be one of my other comments here. Um, if you're just starting out, if you're just building out your app, consider when you need to bring in a build engineer, when you need to have a dedicated uh, point of contact for this. Uh, as you can tell from my story earlier, we're kind of stumbling through this. The infrastructure teams, meaning the development team, and, and trying to figure this thing out. And we're actually about to settle down on development runs a lot of this, and my team is just providing the infrastructure, which really means I'm just paying Sean here to do the, that job for me. Um, go so, on vacation. Huh? You can go on vacation. Exactly. So I can do more talks like this and tell you to just use his stuff. <laughs> anyway. Um, but yes, uh, build engineers are essential. Someone, we talked about build time. We have engineers that are so busy working on new features and, and getting uh, bugs out of the way that we really don't have anyone sitting around going, okay, but is this build script efficient? Is there some way that we can uh, paral parallelize this process? Or what is the CPU profile on this VM during the build time? Like, am I fully using this or not? You need to have someone who can sit down and look at that at some point in your growth process. So uh, highly recommend that. Great, well that's a great place to leave it. Um, I'd like to thank you guys so much for spending your time with us and thanks everybody for uh, sticking around and all the great questions, so thank you.